Okay, so the next thing on there is about disassembling clutch packs. And with a lot of transmissions, this is the core of what we're doing. We're putting new clutches and new seals into it. In fact, if you buy a, a rebuild kit, that's primarily what you're getting, is a whole bunch of clutches and a bunch of seals. And then if you get in the transmission and find out the steel plates are destroyed um, or a band or something is broken, you end up ordering those parts. But this is kind of the core of tear it down and we're gonna rebuild it. So there are two clutch packs on this. It depends on the manufacturer, what they're gonna call it. Um, if I was Toyota, this would be K1 and K2, but this is a Chrysler transmission, so we're gonna use front clutch and rear clutch. And in this one's case, the first thing we're gonna do is the rear clutch. And we're gonna do the rear clutch because there's not much out there to jump out and surprise you. Uh, however, on the front clutch, we're gonna have some specialized tools for that. So what you'll do is take your front clutch and just set it aside. And we're going to go into what we refer to as the uh, rear clutch. This one, sometimes I refer to this as the uh, input clutch. And that's because it's on my input shaft. Comes here back to these guys. These should be fairly loose. You should be able to wiggle them around, move them up and down. If they don't move, then something's wrong. Something's been installed upside down. It's too tight, something along those lines. Um, you may have a hole in your bench. Some of these benches, I drill holes in them so we can put things like this all the way through them. This one I just need to drill a bigger hole it looks like. Or if you have a torque converter, you can actually sit there on the table, shove the nose into it. It stabilizes this thing so it's not rolling around on the bench. It's just habits that I've gotten into. Um, as far as tools go, we don't need anything fancy for this particular system. We just need a screw, uh, basically a uh, screwdriver. In this case, I've got two. Um, I particularly like ones where the blade is a little bit sharper than normal. In fact, I've got some screwdrivers in there that we've ground down to a sharper blade. And we need that so we can get behind our snap rings. Um, this one is one that I, I custom ground years and years ago. You see how it has kind of a funny hook on it? Sometimes when we're getting these snap rings out, they're deep into a transmission. And the reason that's on there is I can go in there behind a snap ring and when I start to twist, the hook grabs it for me. So this is one of those things where you go into my toolbox at home that I've got. I've got a drawer full of custom Jason tools that you can't buy anywhere else. Sometimes that's what they look like. They're a little ugly, but you know what? It may be a faster transmission builder. And sometimes snap rings can be frustrating. So you come up with a good way to take them apart. Um, keep that forever. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is there is a snap ring right here. This one is perfectly safe to take off. You can see there's no pressure behind it. I can wiggle the plate behind it. But if I get in there and I can't move things around, that's a good indication there's pressure on that snap ring. Don't just pull it out. This one's perfectly safe, so what I'm gonna do is I'll take a screwdriver. I just happen to have the one with a hook, but I don't really need it for this one. I'm gonna come in at about a 45 degree angle and just kind of twist so you can see I'm now behind it. And now all I need to do is get it to pop up. Now you'll notice, where's my thumb? It's still on it. Over, right? So yeah. if this thing tries to come out, it's not going to go land somewhere else. I do this force of habit sometimes without even thinking about it. I just right through the middle of the snap ring so it doesn't go flying out, doesn't ricochet off my head or something. <laughs> land on a very nicely expensively painted car. Right, once I got that out, I can pull it out. Now, here's another habit I get into. This particular snap ring doesn't have a up or a down, but it's very common for these things to be like piston rings where they've got a slight profile on one side, you put them in upside down and you're gonna get weird and, and um, bad behaviors out of a transmission. So when I pull things out, I pull them out and I flip them upside down <coughs> as I disassemble them. That way I know when it goes back together, I'm just gonna grab the part, flip it back into it. That's just always been my process and it keeps me out of trouble, especially with snap rings, assuming nobody ever walks by your bench and picks stuff up and moves it around. Okay, so I'm gonna take this out and I'll lay the first piece down. And the next piece I'm gonna pull out is what's known as a reaction plate. It's usually a fairly thick plate, so when pressure comes up from below, it doesn't distort this thing. So it's usually the biggest, heaviest one. If you're going back together and you've got a big thick plate and a bunch of thin ones and you're not sure, find the opposite side of the apply piston. All the hydraulic pressure we were talking about today is coming this way, so this is gonna be there to hold it back. All right, so I'm gonna take that out, put that over. The next thing I'm gonna get out of here are my clutches. Um, and these are brand new, and part of how I know this, I can see a green mark on there. 
So when these were finished and inspected, they marked them. You know, if I threw a little marker on one of these and I even put a little bit of wear on it, that mark is gone. So I know I'm dealing with very, very fresh clutches. But I can take them all and kind of inspect them. That one looks nice and healthy. Same thing with this. I look at this and I don't see any bluing marks. This thing doesn't look like it's warped or, or crooked in any way, shape, or form. If I'm not sure, I actually sometimes use, oh, it's not in here, the seat and guide machine that Phil has for the machining class. The table on that is dead flat, and I mean perfectly flat. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll set that on there and see if there's any warp to it. If there's a little warp to it, usually we're going to replace it. In this case, we're in pretty good shape. So we'll keep going through. That one looks healthy. Same thing with that one. You may open up some of these transmissions though and find a little bit of wear and tear and damage on them. This one just happens to be a fresh rebuild. All right, pretty good there. Now I did mention that is a brand new clutch. How much material do I get? Yeah, it's like I said, that's probably less than half as thick as the dime, probably a third of it. Which, when these apply, we're going to look at a bunch of different types of clutches, but when these things apply, there's fluid there, and the fluid transfers the energy, and as soon as that fluid is squeezed out, these guys should grab. You should never have a moment where the fluid gets squeezed out and there's not enough pressure for this to grab, and it slips, and you see the RPM go up as the car kind of lurches up to speed. That is a massive amount of damage in a short amount of time. So if you've got a slipping transmission, pull over, sort it out right away. Um, don't let that go on for a long period of time. Okay, so this is my first clutch pack all squealed out, and you'll notice I took it apart just out of habit. I looked at every single piece. Sometimes you'll get a slip in very specific areas. It'll heat it up, you'll get some blue spots. And that's an indication there's a slip or damage in there. Okay, once that's out, it's unique to this one. But uh, I've got another plate, but on the bottom it's got this little bump that sticks out. This is the part that the spring down here pushes against. And what it's doing is it's all the way in here instead of being further out. That helps it get a little leverage over this thing. If that was in a different spot, it was further out in the middle, it would change the amount of pressure. Think about a pry bar. If you've got a pry bar in something and something's right here, you've got a lot of force on it, but if it's all the way back here, it's hard to lift. Um, if you haven't done anything with a pry bar, you'll, you'll figure that out when you try it. The same thing, I look at it, make sure there's no bluing or any damage to it, because this does not come in the rebuild kit. In most rebuild kits, the steel plates, they don't come either, so you want to inspect them. Uh, a more master kit will. Okay, next thing we're going after in here is another snap ring. Now, if these were reassembled correctly last time, the snap ring that came out on top should be relatively flat. This one's going to have a little curve to it. Um, it's got a little wave up and down, you'll see it as I pull it out. And what that is, is this is first gear. This does not have an accumulator with it. They put a little bit of an orifice in it to slow the, the uh, apply on. And this spring right here will compress as the piston comes on. That's your buffer. The reason we do that is you don't really feel this clutch right here going in and out. Um, once this comes on, we've connected the torque converter to the transmission. So the only time this thing hits is when you put it in drive. And we consider that a garage shift, your foot's on the brake, it should go on, you might get a little bump, no big deal. But when you shift back down to first gear, another clutch is letting go, this isn't reapplying. And so we don't have all the softening devices on it. If you get behind this, dig in a little bit and twist, and it'll come out. There we go. All right, and so what you see is, that is not flat, is it? No. That's not damaged, twisted, or otherwise broken. That's by design. And if you could imagine the fluid pressure coming on, this is going to fight a little bit, and it's going to have to squeeze that flat. That gives you a little cushion on the shift. Now, this fits in both grooves. So if somebody is not paying attention or laying out their clutches properly, and they reassemble it, and they throw this snap ring on the bottom and this one on the top, you don't get a proper apply on this thing. You have a transmission that's going to shift just a little bit harder because it's squishing the clutches before it gets this one squished on the top. Small thing, but it will accelerate the wear on this thing and shifts that the customer doesn't want. Okay, so that's laid out. The next thing down here is my return piston. So what I have right here is a, piston, a little reply spring. My piston pushes on this and applies my clutches. 
However, that snap ring's on top of it, so as soon as I want this thing to go back into neutral, I take the hydraulic pressure away from underneath, and this guy will push my piston back down, turn my clutches off. Same thing, it goes one way, and this is why I flip everything over. It goes like this on top of the piston. I can install it like this and reassemble the transmission. The problem being, it's no longer touching my piston, so what's the piston doing all the time? It's bumping to that. Just slightly upon, like, even when it goes off, so maybe a little movement in the clutches will push the piston down, but it doesn't pull it out of the way. I did run into this recently. Um, a good friend of Earl and I, uh, Mike, has a uh, hemi-powered PT Cruiser, if you could imagine this thing. Has anyone seen it? No. You might have seen this thing rolling around. Well, he had some company, some hot rod company, build him a special transmission for it, and it burned it up. So he brought the transmission here, we took it apart, um, and I remember the group taking it apart. They were looking at it, and it didn't take them too long to go, well, it doesn't look right. The funnest part was you had to open the glove box to change the spark. So, I've got my snap rings, my clutches, my return um, spring out. Now I want to get my applied piston. Uh, you know what, one of these days everyone in here is going to break the transmission. It'll happen. Can't put them together without doing that. So this is the piston that just came out of this. This is what hydraulic pressure goes behind to push it on. You can see on the outside, those are the seals. So when we burn up a transmission or something or you cook your seals, that's what we're referring to. I'm going to set this back down. We're not going to take these seals off. We're not going to take this shaft out. Uh, that's as far as this guy's going to go. But this comes back to what we were talking about with, with Pascal's Law. Line pressure comes into this thing through a couple of these holes here, feeds through a hole in the back, pushes on this guy, and that's what applies it. That's my surface area. I mean, if you imagine that as a uh, caliper for your, for your brakes, that's a lot of surface area, isn't it? It's probably 10 or 15 square inches on there if I were actually measure out little blocks on it. Well, if I've got 10 square inches and I'm pushing 80 PSI, this is easy math, 800 pounds, squeezing this, right? Um, it's probably more than that, probably closer to 1,000. That's a lot of weight on this thing. When we look at a diesel truck, um, I might run 80 PSI, but it'll have 25 square inches on it. Right? So we, we may be looking at um, almost 2,000 pounds of pressure. That's like a small car trying to crush your clutches together. Shouldn't slip. And pull the seals out. And as we pull the seals out, same thing, observe which way they're pointing. These are what are known as lip seals, so they do swell out a little bit one way. They do that so when pressure comes out this way, it pushes the seal out hard against the edge and seals it up better. If I had pressure coming this way, it's going to pull the seal in, and where's all the fluid pressure going to go? Uh, passes right through. Right out, right? So if you put a seal on upside down, reassemble the whole transmission, and try and go for a drive, that clutch is going to slip, it's going to burn, you have to take the whole transmission apart because you put a seal on upside down. So pay very careful attention to them. Taking them out is pretty easy. Um, you can just kind of grab them. They're a little bit stretchy. Just try not to stretch them too far. Go ahead and pull them out. And same thing, we're going to set them down here. And there's one on the inside. I'm going to pull that guy out, set him down. And then finally my piston, I'm going to lay that down. The only other thing I want you to notice is all of them have this little ball bearing punched into them. They should move around. If you blow air through it, you should be able to get air through it. If you pour fluid in it, you should see it come out. There's always going to be a little BB that leaks fluid through here. Now, it could be in the piston. It could be built into the drum. They're always towards the outer edge. Anybody want to guess why we put an intentional leak in this? After all the work we do to seal it up tight. It is a bit of an orifice. But you think about it, you put brand new seals in it, nice machine surfaces, everything's just right and then somebody drills a hole through it and puts a little BB in it. Well, if I've got a chamber where fluid comes in here and that's where it goes out, so there's still fluid in here, and I start to spin this drum really hard, where's the fluid gonna go? Go through? Out, right? If I have centrifugal force, isn't pressure building on that fluid? Mm -hmm. So if the fluid can't escape, and I'm spinning this drum really fast going down the road, I'm applying pressure out here on the edges, what's this piston gonna do? Is it going to push itself back out and try to re-engage clutches that it shouldn't be engaging? In this one's case, this one, um, it disengages and going to neutral. But if I had fluid in there and no way for that fluid pressure to bleed out, and I sat there just for fun in, net, in neutral revving my engine, this would start to engage. So I'm like, hey, I put it in neutral and it doesn't go anywhere. But if I rev it up to three grand, it starts to grab and roll. 
that probably shouldn't happen in neutral, right? And so we have things like this. So if you get a weird description, it is very, very rare that the customer says in neutral it drives when I gun the thing. Why exactly they've gun it in neutral, I don't know, but you know, people try a lot of things. But if I have a car where it starts to try and engage different clutches at high speeds when it shouldn't, there's a good chance this thing plugged up. Think about it this way. If I got clutches coming apart, where's that crud right next to? Right next to my little custom drill leak, right, in the system. So, something worth looking at. This one I think has got too much trans gel to get it to jingle, but a lot of times you can wiggle and hear it shake around. Okay, so once that's out, you're gonna have a spot on your bench where what I wanna see with every single group, and then we'll come back here, is have this disassembled all the way. Don't pull these guys off. And have your clutches and your piston lined up like this. Don't forget to take your seals out. Any questions? Okay, we're doing the one with an input shaft. Please do not take anything out of this one. There will be surprises in there you don't want.